In Eden, before the sin that separated man from God, the garden was watered, trees grew fruit, and there was minimal effort to obtain food. After the separation, the physical part of the curse included hard labor to grow food, and having babies became difficult and painful. But God is handing us our salvation with minimal effort. When, I, when I'm weak, therefore I am strong. He is providing His Spirit. He provides His protection, His instructions. He gives us the faith of our Savior. We have to continually choose His way and submit our life to His outline. If we live through to the millennium, it will not be through our own efforts. Alternatively, if we are resurrected, it will not be through our own efforts. But is this a full story? Are we just going to waft into the millennium or into God's kingdom without effort? Just think on that for a minute. So this year I read some books, and one particular book I read, called, it's read too, um, is, was called Outliers, and hence the title of this sermon. It gives some interesting perspective when you look at the Bible and at the, the patterns that emerge in the statistics. The first point had to do with precursors of success. And it asked the question, was success based on talent or hard work or special circumstances? And when you look at the world, the successful people, were they given special help or did they just make it through hard work or because they were extremely talented? Usually we think that successful people are the result of hard work. But it may not be that simple. Now, I'll give you some examples, and I'm going to read from the book a little bit. One is Bill Joy is the first example. Now, some of you may know and recognize that name. He's one of the most influential people in computer and internet land that you can come across. And I'll just read from here. The University of Michigan opened its new computer center in 1971 in a brand new building on Beale Avenue in Ann Arbor with beige brick exterior walls and a dark glass front. And it goes on to explain what was in the rooms, but that's not significant. The University of Michigan had one of the most advanced computer science programs in the world. Over the course of the computer center's life, thousands of students passed through that white room, and the most famous of whom was a gawky teenager named Bill Joy. Joy came to the University of Michigan the year the computer center opened. He was 16. He thought he, he, he came, as he says it, he was a no-date nerd. He thought he might end up as a biologist or a mathematician, but late in his freshman year, he stumbled across the computer center and he was hooked. From that point on, the computer center was his life. He programmed whenever he could. He got a job in the summer with a prof uh, computer science professor so he could continue his programming through the summer. In 1975, he enrolled in a graduate school at the University of California at Berkeley, and there he buried himself even deeper in the world of computer software. During the oral exams for his PhD, he made up a particularly complicated algorithm on the fly that, as one of his admi many admirers had written, so stunned his examiners that one of them later compared the experience to Jesus confounding the elders. He was the man who, with, in collaboration with a small group of programmers, rewrote Unix, which became basically the operating system of the internet and business. After he graduated from Berkeley, he co-founded Sun Microsystems, which some of you have also probably heard of that. Very influential company. And there he rewrote another computer language called Java, and his legend grew still further. 
Bill Joy is one of the most influential people in the modern history of computing. And the story of his genius has been told many times, and the lesson is always the same. Here was a world that was a purist meritocracy. Computer programming didn't operate on an old boy network where you got ahead because of money or connection. It was judged solely on talent and accomplishments. It was a world where the best men won, and Joy was clearly one of the best men. Well, that will come into question. <coughs> but particularly note, from that point on, it was his life. So achievement equals talent plus preparation, right? Not so fast. Go back to the page where I have that written. Let's get this from here. here we go. Okay. For almost a generation, psychologists around the world have been engaged in a spirited debate over a question that most of us would consider to have been settled years ago. The question is, is there such thing as innate talent? And basically we say achievement is talent plus preparation. But the problem with this view is that the closer psychologists look at the careers of gifted, the smaller role innate talent seems to play and the bigger role preparation seems to play. And to bring that point home, they did a study to compare talent versus effort in the 1990s. And with the help of, let's see if this was at Berlin's Academy of Music, it's an elite school. They brought three violinist groups in. The first group were the stars, the absolute best. The students with the potential to become world-class soloists. In the second were those judged to be merely good. In the third were students who were unlikely to ever play professionally and who intended to be music teachers in the public school system. All of the violinists were asked the same question. Over the course of your entire career, ever since you first picked up the violin, how many hours have you practiced? Everyone in the three groups started at roughly the same age, around five years. In those first years, everyone practiced roughly the same amount, about two or three hours a week. But when the students were around age eight, the real differences started to emerge. Students would end up the best in their class begin to practice more than everyone else. Six hours a week by age nine, eight hours by age 12, 16 hours by 14, and up and up until at the age of 20, they were practicing, that is purposefully and single-mindedly playing their instruments with the intent to get better, well over 30 hours a week. So they were in full time. In fact, by the age of 20, the elite performers had each totaled 10,000 hours of practice. Now that number will come into play. It's, in, it's a significant number. By contrast, the merely good students had totaled 8,000 hours, and the future mu music teachers just over 4,000 hours. And the striking thing about this study is that Erickson, who's the psychologist that did it, and his colleagues couldn't find any naturals. That is, musicians who floated effortlessly to the top while practicing a fraction of the time their peers did. By contrast, they couldn't find any grinds either. The people who worked harder than anybody else, yet didn't have what it takes to break the top ranks. Their research says that suggests that once a musician has enough ability to get into a top music school, the thing that distinguishes one performer from another is how hard he or she works. That's it. And what's more, the people at the very top don't just work harder or even much harder than anyone else. They work much, much harder.
The emerging picture from such studies is that the 10,000 hours of practice is required to achieve the level of mastery associated with being a world-class expert in anything. In study after study, the composers of composers, basketball players, fiction writers, ice skaters, concert pianists, chess players, master criminals, interesting, <laughs> and what have you, the number comes up again and again. So you might keep that number in mind as we go through this rest of the sermon. It seems that it takes the brain this long to assimilate all that it needs to know to achieve true mastery. I'll give you a couple more examples here. And again, I want to remind you that people at the top work much, much harder. Is the 10,000 hour rule a general rule of success? If we scratch below the surface of every great achiever, we always find the equivalent of a, the Michigan Computer Center or the hockey all-star team, some sort of special opportunity for practice, does that have any impact? There's one example that is everyone will know is the Beatles. They came to the United States in February of 64, but they had been together since 1957. So they had been together, together several years. And those who knew them expected them to be a good local band, but they did get a special break. In 1960, while they were still just a struggling high school rock band, they were invited to play in Hamburg, Germany. And it was not the best circumstances that they were in, but they got to practice. And Hamburg in those days did not have a rock and roll music club, they had strip clubs. But the bands were hired to play eight hour sets. So they, they had to learn more music, they had to learn to play, you know, they didn't have a, a what, what would you call it, a sophisticated audience, mostly drunks that wandered in and out, but they still had to play for eight hours. They were practicing. And by the time they were done in Hamburg, it said what they said themselves, we got better and got more confidence. We couldn't help it with the experience we were playing all night long. It was handy, them being foreign. We had to try even harder and put our heart and soul into it just to get ourselves over. In Liverpool, we'd only ever done one hour sessions and we just used to do our best numbers, the same ones at every one. In Hamburg, we had to play for eight hours, so we really had to find a new way of playing. And that was seven days a week. So during that time, they played an estimated, they had 270 nights in just over a year and a half. By the time they had their first burst of success in 1964, in fact, they had performed live an estimated 1,200 times. You know, that's extraordinary. Most bands don't, today don't perform 1,200 times in their entire career. The Hamburg Crucible is one of the things that set the Beatles apart. And one more example is Bill Gates. Now, you love him or hate him, he did have some special circumstances and he's a very talented man. When he was, I believe it was seventh grade, let's, in seventh grade, he was sent to Lakeside, a private school that catered to Seattle's elite families. His father was a wealthy lawyer, and I forget what his mother did, but they were both professional people and they had plenty of money. Midway through his second year at Lakeside, the school started a computer club. And 
the amazing thing was this was 1968. Most colleges didn't have computer clubs in the 60s. Even more remarkable was the kind of computer Lakeside bought. And Bill Joy didn't even have this kind until later. The school didn't have its students learn programming by the computer punch card where you had to punch everything in and feed it in. But they had a time-sharing terminal with a direct link to a mainframe in downtown Seattle. The whole idea of time-sharing only got invented in 1965. Someone was pretty forward-looking. Bill Gates got to do real-time programming as an eighth grader in 1968. From that moment forward, Gates lived in the computer room. He and a number of others began to teach themselves how to use this strange new device. And as it developed, there was another parent who had a son in his class who had a software program that he needed some help on and he needed testers. And he hired Bill Gates and a couple of other kids out of that class to actually, their senior year was devoted to testing the software. They didn't go to classes, they went and worked for their senior year. And Gates himself said, it was my obsession of his early high school years. I skipped the athletics. I went up there at night. We were programming on weekends. It would be a rare week that we didn't get 20 or 30 hours in. Again, full-time programming in high school. And as I mentioned, in his senior year, he managed to convince his teachers to let him let him decamp to Bonneville <clears throat> under the guise of an independent study project. There he spent the spring writing code supervised by a man named John Norton, who Gates says taught him as much about programming as almost anyone he'd ever met. Those five years from eighth grade through the end of high school were Bill Gates' Homburg, and by any measure he presented with an even more extraordinary series of opportunities than Bill Joy. So he had tremendous opportunity, and he developed a talent. Again, to emphasize that quote, people at the top of whatever field work much, much harder. With that in mind, God has been preparing us for his kingdom, for the job that he has chosen us and set us on the path to complete. What is our part in accomplishing that? Well, have we put in our 10,000 hours? And another guideline that is found in Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Let's turn there. Matthew 24, 13. And we'll look at a context a bit. We'll start in verse 9. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And to this point, we have not had to face this type of trial. But we have and will continue to face and endure the following. We have to be actively enduring. Verse 10, And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. Now we've seen and heard during this feast that many times that this is going to happen. These will be the Laodicean group that succumb to the lust of the flesh for position, power, money, and will cast off their righteous garment and turn their back on righteousness. So once again, we need to look at that. But the one who endures to the end will be saved.
We are also told in James 1, James 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Endure can also be translated, the Greek word there can be translated perseveres. We put on our time, we put in our work, we put in our 10,000 hours. It's the Greek is hupomeno, and it means to abide or not recede or flee. We need to set our face toward God's kingdom. And furthermore, in Philippians 2.5. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ. This is the only way that we will endure to the end. That we will be able to endure the temptation. Is to have the faith of our Savior. And through with this we can learn to perfectly resist the pulls of our flesh or temptations. Back in James, let's go back to James 1. James 1, chapter 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience and endurance. But let patience have its perfect work, and that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Remember, those at the top work much, much harder. Again, we've been reminded this and other sermons at this feast. Resist covetousness. Resist selfishness. Resist coldness. Resist anger. Resist hatred. We should not be, we should not be striving, or protect, perhaps more accurately stated, we should not be allowing ourselves to be in conformity with man. Rather, we should be striving to bring our thoughts and our innermost being into alignment with God, resisting the evil influence of our adversary. Again, it's he that endures to the end, not almost to the end, but to the end, either the end of our lives or until we become spirit, which is essentially the same thing. Let's go back to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 10. And verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful that he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now we all have the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. to endure and to fight. If we go to Galatians 5 and verse 16. I 
I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There was another article that I came across last month that was saying that in the 50s, approximately 40% of young people met their mates through family or church. And I think that was 25 or 30% were through family, family contacts, and the rest were through church. And then it went down through, it had bars and various things that were extant. No one met online until the late 70s. Now, in 2024, approximately 90% meet online. It's a staggering statistics. Very few meet through family, church, or other social events. Since so much takes place online, and if you keep track of it, the algorithm, algorithms are set to draw and guide the unwary into more and more prurient material. So all these kids that are online are subtly being directed to the darker places on the internet. On platforms like YouTube, Instagram, etc., and even Telegram, which is ostensibly a communication program, they're, they're rife with pornography. People are trading pictures and other junk on, the, on there. Now, traditionally, porn has been aimed at men, but in this article, they noted that it's being formed, it's being directed to attract women as well. So there are more and more women becoming addicted to porn as well as men. Huge swaths of all demographics have been addicted to the content fix available on these platforms, even outside of the porn. There are many people that are addicted to just watching the videos, just flipping through the videos. But with porn, the damage is almost irreversible. The ability to form relationships is damaged and the family unit is further destroyed. Again, the results of our adversary. Without serious therapy or healing or intervention, these people will not be able to resist other forms of temptation, including the desire to take their own life. When they become tired of it and depressed, they just off themselves. Suicide is at an all-time high among the younger demographics. And without structure, which has been taken away in the, many of the school systems, there's no reason to resist any pull or influence. The church is out of the picture, the school's out of the picture, the parents are out of the picture, and now it's just whatever they come across. This nihilism is not limited to the end time, but it is worse and more widespread now than since the days of Noah or Lot. Let's go to Luke 17. Luke 17, 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and they were being given in marriage right up to the day Noah entered into the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, people were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, and building. But on the day Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be the same on the day the Son of Man is revealed. More specifically, we in the church are warned in 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 2, We'll begin in verse 1. 
But there were also false prophets among, this peop among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their dest destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, and bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. Note, Noah had to endure great tribulation and mockery right up until the flood. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes in Lot's time, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. He was enduring much as we are enduring this vile society around us. But notice verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, and we're seeing that in the political process. It seems to be emphasized this, this cycle. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained on covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor. And I think we all know people who have done that and chosen where to go based on money. following the way of Balaam of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity, and a dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained his madness. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness. And we could look around in the world today, and we are surrounded by lewdness by various perversions. Men become women. Women become men. Or maybe they become some animal. Or think they do. The ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. So we can be tempted by that if we are not very careful. They promise them liberty. Oh, we can, you, you'll feel much better if you change what you do or change what you think you are. They themselves are slaves of corruption. The latter end is worse for them. Whoops, skipped over some stuff there. For by whom a person is overcome, by him he is also brought into bondage. So instead of being free, you become like them in bondage. For if, after we've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are again entangled if we do not endure and remain steadfast in them and, and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. 
And this is what I mentioned earlier. We don't want to endure almost to the end. We want to go all the way to the end. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to wallowing in the mire. 1 John 2.16 For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. In this context, I was also reading Leviticus 26 and noted the progression in the curses and found it interesting. In Leviticus 26, Leviticus 26, verses 16 to 18. And this is the curses if they don't obey. And I for my part will do this to you. I will inflict horror on you, consumption and fever, which will diminish eyesight and drain away the vitality of life. You will sow your seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you. You will be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when there is no one pursuing you. Verse 18. If... In spite of all these things, you do not obey me. I will discipline you seven times more on your account of your sins. Skip down to verse 21. If you walk in hostility against me and are not willing to obey me, I will increase your affliction seven times according to your sins. Drop again down to 23. In spite of these things, if you do not allow yourselves to be disciplined and you walk in hostility against me, I myself will also walk in hostility against you and strike you seven times on account of your sins. And then verse 40. There's hope. However, when they confess their iniquity and their ancestors' iniquity, which they committed by trespassing against me, by which they also walked in hostility against me, I will remember, verse 42, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. Verse 44, In spite of this, however, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them and abhor them to make a complete end of them, to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. I will remember them for them the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out from the land of Egypt in the sight of nations to be their God. I am the Lord. This is especially applied, can be applied to our brethren in the greater churches. There are many meeting with various flavors and I think I heard the statistic that there's over a thousand various groups. Some of them are eccentric. Let's put it that way. Though they are not with us or with one of the major groups, they are not necessarily abandoned by God. Our brethren are scattered across the earth as salt. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ. And let's avoid any temptation to assign co condemnation or a judgment. Knowing our own weaknesses and failings, we need to endure in our own correction and continue to shore up our section of the temple where we are building. And in this reference, let's go over and look at Haggai. And I'm going to read some from the Exploring the Bible in Haggai. Just as the adversaries of God's people in that day influenced them to put off building the temple, so the adversary, 
of God's people in the time of the end has succeeded in convincing them. Despite major spiritual deficiencies, they are satisfactory and acceptable. Just the way they are. And have no need to be working on themselves, preparing themselves to be the bride of Christ. Just preach the word, pay and pray, and you'll be okay. But that's not true. You need to put in your 10,000 hours. Haggai 1 and verse 3 to 7. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, says the Lord God of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. As we can see, remember 1 Peter 5.8, adversary is a roaring lion. Our adversary is not human and he seeks our total destruction. He uses every device possible. And for us, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life to distur deter us, distract, demotivate, and discourage. And every day, every hour, he's working on us. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Israel had not endured. They allowed themselves to become distracted. And in Haggai 2, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, and this time frame of this message was given during the Feast of Tabernacles, which would have been October 17th that year. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is a left among you that saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you now see it? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? In the 67 years that had elapsed since Solomon's temple was destroyed, only a small number of people alive at that time would have any memory of it. And the finished splendor of what they were building would have been weak. So God offered them encouragement. Yet now be strong, take courage. Zerubbabel says the Lord, and be strong and take courage. Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong or take courage. All you people of the land, and work, for I am with you. I am with you. God reassured them that even though the construction of the temple would be hard, tedious work, and would require more time to complete than they might think. He was patient and would remain with them as long as they pressed forward with their obligation to him. Endure. Push forward for your 10,000 hours. We're building our temple. Or we are the temple that we're building. And Haggai 2.5 at the end. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. The presence of God with them is what set them apart from other people. The reason God wanted the temple built was to indicate to the rest of the nations that he dwelt with his people. Since God expressed his intention to continue being with them, there was no reason for them to fear any opposition to the fulfillment of the task before them. Again, that's taken from the... 
the Exploring the Bible Minor Prophets. Haggai 2.7 And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The temple, the place where God dwells, that God fills with glory at the time Christ come, will consist of those who participate in the first resurrection. That's why we want to endure to the end. Haggai, let me read the conclusion. It is the duty of every individual selected by the Father to be part of that temple, to work diligently on that section of the temple which God has directed him or her to build, which is himself or herself. Personal preparation is required in order for Christ's bride to be made ready and for his temple to be completed. Once it is finished, the glory of God will fill it at the first resurrection an event that is symbolized by the ceremony of the elevated loaves on the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. Therefore, the name of Haggai, the festival of Yah, the prophet whose primary focus revolved around completing the building of the temple, most likely should be connected to that particular festival. Our sole focus should be on improving what we are doing. Those at the top don't just work harder. They work very much harder. Again, those who endure to the end will be saved. So keep practicing your 10,000 hours and endure. We are given an ab admonition in Isaiah 55 and verses 6 and 7. To seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. James 4.8 goes on the same vein. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your heart. Your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There will be, will be and continue to be the temptation to fall into the pattern of Laodicea. Thinking you're, well, I'm okay. I just got to just keep going to services and that's it. No, we have to keep working, putting, putting our heart. It has to be our very life to the exclusion of everything else. Remember Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever task lies to your hand, and this is from Revised English Bible, do it with your might, because in Sheol, for which you are bound, there is neither doing nor thinking, neither understanding nor wisdom. Revelation 2.17 seals it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And again, I'm going to read from Exploring the Bible here about the hidden manna. The third promise to the church involves unfathomable understanding. And this comes into practice on this and the outliers as special circumstances and blessings of, for example, in Bill Gates, the computer center that he could work in. Bill Joy, the computer center he could work in. They're placed in an opportunity that no one else had access to. And we have that. The third promise to the church involves unfathomable understanding. The word hidden is from the Greek krypto, which means purposely kept secret. The word manna refers to the bread from heaven, which Jesus defines as himself in John 6.30. Only those who eat that manna can receive eternal life. Jesus Christ is the true manna. He is also the word of God, the one who reveals God's purpose or revelation. The hidden manna, which we commemorate every Passover, represents things which God 
will not make known until one enters the spirit realm. And that's why we're pressing forward. We want to know those things. We want to understand fully things that we only partially understand now. Those who have received and accepted God's invitation have been given a sampling of this manna already. 1 Corinthians 2, 9-10 Nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. We do not know everything by far. We do know much more than those who have not yet been called. But there is so much more to come at the resurrection when Jesus himself reveals those hidden things to us. There are things which we are incapable of receiving at this time because we must be spirit in order to relate to them. Hang on to what we know. Hang on. Don't ever let it go. It would be terrible to let it go at the last instant. Isaiah 65 Let's go over there. Isaiah 65, verse 11. But you are those who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, or fortune, and who furnish a drink offering for, for many, which is fate. I, therefore I will number you for the sword, and you shall all bow down to slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes, and chose what that in which I do not delight. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry sorrow of heart and wail for grief of spirit. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen, for the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name. In the parable, God said, Go away from me. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. We don't want to be in that number. We want to be in this number. Isaiah 62, verses 2 and 3. I think the reference is wrong on that. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. And you shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. When God gives us spiritual life, he has the right to give us the name of his choosing, just as he renamed Adam, Jacob, Simon and Saul. God's promise involves a special invitation to an event where information will be revealed about the spirit realm and shown to the church. That invitation also includes the event where each member of the church, the body of Christ, will receive the name that he or she will carry throughout eternity. I'm looking forward to that day. But again, how do we get there? Hard work and endurance. Second Timothy, Second Timothy two, Verse 3, Therefore, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Drop down to verse 10. 
Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Drop down to verse 12. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Chapter 4 in verse 3. This is by contrast. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Verse 5. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the, an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now this was written to Timothy as an admonition to him, but it also applies to all of us. Endure. Keep after it. Let's go to Revelation 3. And verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go, go out no more. And revised in English Bible says, will, will remain there forever. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. And again, I'm going to read from the exploring the Bible here. Names. God has names attached to all the major aspects of New Jerusalem, the abode of the Father and Jesus, which comes to the new earth after the physical universe ceases. The gates of New Jerusalem have the 12, tri 12 tribes of Israel, the foundation, the 12 apostles. The cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Revelation 14 even seems to indicate that there will be a predetermined number of pillars. The cornerstone has been placed. The foundation has been laid. The next step in construction is to raise the pillars so that the rest of the building can be erected upon them. The pillars are put in place at the beginning of the millennium, at the time when the building quickly takes shape, occurs. The church will always be the pillars in the family of God just as Christ will always be the cornerstone. And the church has been invited by God to always have the notoriety of being the ones upon whom the rest of the family will be built. Throughout all eternity and the rest of God's plan, the church will be the ones who will be pointed to as those who stood up in that time when the devil ruled. So how does this apply to us individually? Specifically, prayer, Bible study, meditation, and fellowship. How about fellowship? We often talk about the first three. Sometimes we skip over fellowship. Malachi 3.16 Then those who respected the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord took notice. A scroll was prepared before him in which were recorded the names of those who respected or feared the Lord and honored his name. And the New Living says, and always thought about the honor of his name. The complete Jewish Bible says, and had respect for his name. The book Outliers is referencing, if you don't already know this, in statistics, uh, for example, if you're a teacher, your grades will fall within a cur the bell curve. There's a certain number of failures, a certain number of outstanding students, but the bulk of them fall in the middle, and it's a generally bell-shaped curve. Outliers are data that falls outside of that group. And other curves are like this or across a page like this. 
but the outliers are, are data that's outside of that. We are so far outside the data curve because God has called us and made us spirit that we don't even register on the page. He has set us aside and in the spirit world, not the physical. So our minds are to be different. So how do we achieve that 10,000 hours? Is it 10,000 hours of just endurance? We're gritting our teeth. Is it 10,000 hours of prayer? And in this context, I suspect that many of the widows have far exceeded their 10,000 hours. And I don't want you to think that, well, I'm at 9,900 and I can't quite make it. That's not what I mean. I'm, it's an example. It gives you an outline and, a, and something to think about. Is it 10,000 hours of Bible study? How about 10,000 hours of fellowship? With brethren? Or with God in prayer and meditation? God sees things as they are. We know that because God exists in eternity. God is not bound by time. He sees past, present, and future as part of that state. And the YHVH, or Yahweh, however it's pronounced, defines that. Was, is, and is to come. When he says that he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, it shows the same thing. He has no beginning or end. Therefore, he is I am. That's why he told us through the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1. Verse 2. It's grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God on every remembrance of you, always in prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from, from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1. First John 1. And verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship him, with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all from sin, or from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's finish in Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Dropping to verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We won't fall into that Laodicean attitude of thinking that we are okay. Dropping further to verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. 
I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But we must endure those behaviors while in the flesh, because those around us are practicing them regularly. Let's go back up to verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Endure in repentance, because you will fail. Finally, let's endure in this type of fruit. Let's go to verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. Jump up to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh in its passions and desires. Remember, we should not strive to be in conformity with mankind or even concede to be in conformity. But always keeping our eyes focused on the kingdom, bring our thoughts in alignment with God, whose mercy endures forever. In other words, you should become more of an outlier with each passing day. How are you using your 10,000 hours? <laughs>